Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I was just commenting to my colleagues that I never noticed that the very first thing when you're recording a webinar or setting up a webinar is you have to click on a button that actually says, let's get this started, which automatically makes me think of the Black Eyed Peas. I don't know why that is, but I always think of the Black Eyed Peas. Let's get this, Never mind. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, great, great to see people buzzing in here. Numbers climbing, very much my, like my uh, stock market um, should do today, hopefully, if it's uh, performing correctly, our stock market. But uh, very much looking forward to kicking off um, this week with all of you and um, kicking off with a very, no pun intended, different kind of seminar. Uh, for those of you who are veterans of all of this, please know, and I'll reiterate this in housekeeping, that you could chat away, let us know where you're calling in from, dialing in from, zooming in from, um, to the extent that the uh, weather is appropriate where you are. I, I noticed today that this is really only about the second or third day this year that I've had to put a sweater on because it's actually fall weather is in the air here in uh, Northern California, certainly in San Francisco on the west side of town where I live. It is uh, horrifically chilly that, today, hence the sweater. Not turning on the heat yet, gonna wait another week or two on that. But it's so great to see so many people joining us today. Laura, how is it in your part of the world? It's a little chilly here too, actually. Cooler than expected, but welcome. You know, it's not muggy or humid, so that's wonderful. And it is technically fall, right? I mean, we it should is. be getting cooler weather. If we were still warm, um, I would be getting to worry that this climate change thing is maybe even worse than I thought it was going to be, although it is bad. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Some point seems to come up every single session. Well, I'm at about a minute or so after 10 o'clock, and I'm going to go ahead with everybody's collective permission, um, because I am prompt. Um, and we're going to start off on time here. It'll take me a few minutes to do housekeeping and all those other good things. Um, Lee Mang, anything that you want to say before we get started, except for maybe no, Dan and Wiki Talk and all that other good stuff? All right, let's get started here. Um, boom, come on, move screen. Go, oh, there we go, housekeeping. All right. Um, for many of you, this is not your first rodeo, as they say. For those of you for which you are joining us for the first time in a full circle beverage conference seminar accompanied by Master of the World Wines, I would encourage you, in fact, implore you to please open and pour your wines um, if you have not done so already. You will notice that all of the wines are sealed. They all say Master of the World on the front, but you'll also notice when you turn them around on the back, there's a side that's a little uh, sticker that says peel to reveal. If you do that, it will literally uncoil the sleeve on the outside and reveal the identity of the wine. If you do not know, want to know, I should say what the identity of the wine is before we actually taste it, leave that on. If you wanna know what everything is, of course, um, peel it off and then you'll know what the identities of the wines are one through six. Um, oxygen is your friend. Um, and I would encourage you as well to taste the wines at your leisure. Starting in a few minutes, you're gonna find that they change literally every 15 or 20 seconds right now, but keep trying them. Don't feel like you need to wait for Laura and I to invite you into a glass to try it. Um, we're not the kind of people that make you wait 60 minutes into a 75 to 90 minute session before we actually ask you to taste the first wine, enjoy. The flow of today's session is we're gonna talk about the wines in sort of three themes, if you will, three pairs or duets. And um, Laura and I will sort of back and forth there. Um, I will be covering sort of one area. I'm not gonna give it away already. Laura will be covering another area, but we'll be going back and forth. Um, in Zoom land etiquette, as you know, that all uh, questions will be answered um, either live in the back end of our session because we'll have a dedicated Q&A period at the end or emailed afterwards if it's something complicated or if we need to get a winemaker who's not with us today to join us to, to, to um, chime in. Um, there will be a dedicated happy half hour afterwards and you're welcome to, uh, or you should be invited, I see you will be invited to uh, turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones and play um, Hollywood Squares, Brady Bunch, whatever you like to call it with us a little bit later on and directly um, interact with all of us and with the winemakers who are with us today. Um, chat box is encouraged to use it, say hello, send virtual hugs to your friends, please select everybody because if not the only people who can read it are going to be Laura, myself, and our panelists and we're not, well I should say at least I'm not capable of moderating a webinar and following chat at the same time. 
something to do about this, people who can roll their hands this way and that way simultaneously. Uh, there will be a recording of this session made available to you by, via the bit.ly link noted in the overview document that you received at the beginning of the conference. Um, that also has a direct link to the tech sheet, so you can follow along if you want. Again, something over my head tech-wise, but needless to say. And finally, I encourage before we leave this slide to please, please, please complete your feedback uh, sheet at the end. Again, you can get that on the uh, bit.ly link click slash underscore eval at the end um, because your feedback is hypercritical for our sponsors. Without sponsors, there's no BevCon. Laura and I'd be chatting to ourselves today, but having fun, but it wouldn't be quite as fun without all of you. So please make sure that you do that. And then uh, housekeeping number two, um, this is indeed supported by Master the World. Um, and you are, for those of you, again, veterans know that you can start the day before. You don't have to wait for us to uh, jumpstart, especially if you want to taste the wines blind uh, via either the full workout or quick picks technology algorithms we have there, which you can see a picture of on the right when you enter um, the, the, the code of the box in 239C, boom, that picks it up. I think of this as sort of Peloton for the palate. If you want to do a big workout today and start sweating profusely, um, you can do full workout and you'll be asked what it smells like, what it tastes like structurally, where it's from, all that. If you just want to sort of take a leisurely um, stroll around the lake, you can hit quick picks. And if you don't really want to, just give me the information, Evan, hit reveal wine um, profiles and boom, everything comes out to, at the end. Get detailed information afterwards. You can see that picture in the lower right-hand corner that shows you what a reveal wine profile looks like when you're done. But we're really thrilled to have Master of the World participate with us and be able to bring the wines to you live. So all of us, not just myself and Laura, but all of us uh, can be drinking all of the same wines at the same time in real time together, I guess, unless you're watching the recording afterwards. I had thought about that. But you'd still be kind of in real time, semi-real time. So that said, we are blessed to be joined today uh, by a couple of our vintner um, compadres, uh, Lisa uh, Nubauer with Dotel and uh, Pauline Lapierre-Dietrich uh, from Chateau Orient will uh, join us uh, when their wines are brought in and revealed at the appropriate sessions. Uh, Adrien David and Matthew Beaulieu from uh, uh, Chateau uh, uh, Coutet will join us there. You don't know which wine's which, so I'm not really giving away the blind tasting, except that I just made it instead of double blind, I made it single blind, but that's okay. Uh, but they will join us and um, speak with us either live or in, in um, Matthew and Adrian David's case by video a little bit later on. But I really um, appreciate their taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us. Needless to say, in that part of the world, it's a little busy right now, too. Um, so we're really doubly um, appreciative of their ability to join us. And Laura, of course, I am really thrilled uh, to join you uh, with you today. You were um, kind enough to join us last year when we were, I think we were somewhere in Portugal when we did our session together in Beth Combat. You were uh, such a delight, so easy to work with, um, and such a joy and so knowledgeable that it makes so much fun to do that. Today. So I'm glad you're in a command performance for today's session. So let me start off this session today by kind of framing things for you. And when we think of um, the concept, and you can see by the logos just down the bottom of your screen there, we're brought to you today by a campaign, Clink Different, that Laura will talk to you about in a minute, but by two parts of the world that in wine speak um, fit the, the context of what, what we would say are timeless and with legacy. Now, before we jump into that and sort of put our spin, if you will, on that today, I thought it would be appropriate to ask our friends at Miriam Webster what they think of those two words. So timeless has multiple um, definitions, of course, but the one that makes the most sense for wine anyway, in our case, is that not affected by the passage or time or changes in fashion, which is to say that we talk about things as being timeless, being uh, memorialized by time in that sense of there's an expectation of what you're going to get, of what it's always been, of what per se it will always will be, which leads often to the premise of therefore something has a legacy. And a legacy is something that is transmitted or received from an ancestor or a predecessor or from the past. So all these clues create your legacy and um, amplify the timeless element or timelessness of you. And I think for a lot of you, particularly those of us of a certain age, like me, um, we would think about that in the context of a place like Bordeaux. Or we would think about that in the context of a place like Germany that have histories that date back many, many years, many, many centuries. And because of that, have legacy, have a timelessness. And in, in 
in many cases have wrong connotations. I always tell people that wine is not inert. Wine changes. The wines in the bottle change. The wines in your glass are changing in front of you and imagery and, and um, ability to, to be something changes too. Because of that, I would say that if you ask somebody, again, of a certain age or somebody who just simply doesn't know that much except by reputation, what does Bordeaux mean? They'll probably say that, which is completely inappropriate, completely wrong, and completely, literally a caricature of itself. If I were to say to you that, what is your image of Germany to certain people, again, of a certain age or without knowledge of what's really going on, they might come back to you with something like that. Now, we know we're cracking up. I hope you're cracking up, too, that images like this are not only um, caricatures, but they're extraordinarily inaccurate especially in modern contemporary Bordeaux and modern contemporary Germany. And that is why we bring to you today this, content, this concept and this campaign, brilliant I might add, called Clink Different. And I thought, Laura, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that is for people out there in Zoomlandia who may not be as familiar. Absolutely. It's a, a great moment to segue that in. And so, you know, I hear this all the time, even from those that join us, for instance, like the producers that are with us here today, many of them are thinking, what is this clink different? But it is unique to the US. It was a joint venture with the EU to try to encourage additional foresight and understanding in the market of where these locations are today. So they chose Bordeaux and Germany because neither of them have competing products. So if you think about it, we think of Bordeaux as blends and more of the Cabernet family as well as Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. So that's totally different than what we find in Germany. We'll find the focus on single varietals. Of course, we know there's a lot of Riesling, but incredible amounts of Pinot Noir and the other, quote, Burgundian grapes that we're seeing in full force. That was the, the premise, non-competing. Let's draw attention to all these unique wines that are less understood in the marketplace. Let's make sure the buyers understand them so they can translate that message to consumers and let consumers enjoy them. That's so, what this is all yeah, about. I was gonna say in different actually in that sense, the way you explain it, Laura, carries sort of different connotations. Different in the sense that the actual profiles of the wines and obviously the topographics of the region themselves are different, but different also in that we're trying to sort of break paradigms of what people think of and how people have thought about things before. Absolutely. And that even goes deeper in terms of the countries and what they wanted to showcase. So they really want to, of course, show these unique styles and the new generation that's, you know, coming every moment that we see pushing us forward. Um, just to really prove to consumers, both of these, Germany as a country, Bordeaux as a region, are far more advanced than your recollection of historical context. And certainly not true to those caricatures, which we, uh, again, those are caricatures, everybody that we talked about there. So let's um, pick up our first duet. And, and I thought it would be an interesting way to present this by, um, by a quote. And this would be, I, I guess you could sort of look at this as sort of two people talking together. You could look at it as, as all that. But I think about it almost in the sense of, of the two things that I thought about when I was coming up with this would be um, Eugene Livy and Ferris Bueller, right? Hello, hello. Anyone, 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 right? Can you get this? Can you get this? Or, um, you know, um, Matthew, uh, Matthew, um, uh, Matthew Fox, in, as Fox in, in um, Back to the Future, right? Hello, McFly, McFly. And the whole idea of this is that, uh, and this is indeed Back to the Future in many ways, but these are a couple of concepts that we're gonna go over now that have always been there. They were not pulled out of a grocery store or Cracker Jack box like five days ago, just because they're sort of trendy and happening. Um, they've been there a long time. They're seriously underappreciated in the context of where they live in their respective regions and countries. And they're more important than ever and in the case of, of uh, Germany, what we're going to speak about is the category of trocken wines and how that sort of runs counter to, I think, what a popular conception is, is that wines have some level of sweetness to them all the time, regardless. And rosé wines in Bordeaux, 
which a lot of people, if I say rosé, you say Provence. I say rosé, you say Rhone. But rosé wines in Bordeaux have a huge tradition going for. So we wanted to take a look at both of those together. Again, please enjoy wines one and two as we're going through this. We'll talk about them. And um, Laura, why don't you kick us off? Let's let's talk a little bit about Trocken. You'll see that Laura's going to play the German side. I'm going to play the Bordeaux side. We're going to go a little bit back and forth. Wonderful. So just some key facts here. I don't have to read this to you. You guys, you know, read as you want here. But what I find so fascinating our industry is finally starting to realize, whoa, there's a lot more dry production than we were aware of. And if you add that Hauptrocken or off dry category, you know, by law up to 18 grams per liter residual sugar, you realize 70% of production falls in that technical zone. Um, so we normally think of the predicate when we're talking about Germany. Um, I remember the last, the last fact I saw was around six to seven percent of all wines in Germany are labeled predicat. So we kind of have to remind ourselves of this evolution and revolution going on. A lot of it is linked with that climate shift. A lot of it's also linked with that young next gen grower attitude of let's break the boundary here and move forward. So I think as we get into the wines, you're gonna see that this first wine is a great example of that. Now, just keep in mind, um, you know, some of these quote, burgundy grapes, we don't normally think of Pinot Gris as burgundy or Pinot Blanc, but you know, that's where the uh, shift came in with Pinot Noir. That, you know, Germany's a powerhouse in leading the production of this. So that's what they like to draw attention to. It's not just Pinot Noir, it is the white grapes as well. And then the fact that they are so powerful at consumption of sparkling wine. So very unique styles that we don't normally associate that all fall into that dry category. Yeah, and while we will not be doing Zach today because that's really impossible to do at Master of the World, nevertheless, I think that is a point well taken. Um, so Laura, let's jump into this first one. Perfect, I just took a sip of it because I was letting my wines breathe and open. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's just so fun to realize, you know, this is really at the edge of Alsace where 30 kilometers from the border, um, we're flush. You wouldn't notice the difference if you left Germany and went into France. But I think what's so amazing is you feel how sleek and crystalline this is in nature. The Faults is also known as a pretty warm region. You can get 14 plus alcohol easily. But with this push of trying to create this sleek, counterpart, um, transparency, light, this kind of entry level style, just so refreshing. It's definitely a little bit scary when you're on a hot day outside. It's a porch pounder, so it can go down very easily without you realizing it. That's what I love about a lot of these basic style. This is so approachable. You know, what, what, what blows me away here as I go, as I uh, click down myself, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, if I'm, if I'm reading that correct, and that's $14 for a liter, not even 750, but a liter of wine. I know what I'm gonna buy a couple of cases of and throw it in my basement for literally pouch, porch pounding. I like that phrase, as you said before, and done, um, done so well, um, sleek is the right word, refreshing, crunchy, delightful, easy, um, and organic. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Biodynamic, um, everything is right about this wine. I love it too. Such a fun example. And there's so much of this available. That is the point. Yeah, gosh, amazing. And um, have you been here before? This is a beautiful spot on the earth. <laughs> I haven't, but I've been to other wineries close to this. And, you know, a lot of the growers here are very linked. They talk about uh, progress and technology and they work together. They're not really in competition. This area is so focused on the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's easy to produce healthy fruit because you have that rain shadow of the mountains, the Hart Mountains, um, Vosges Mountains. So all that's at stake here. The growers want to elevate the area. They are working to maintain balance. They do know that with climate shift, wines can get a little clunky fast and you really have to be on top of it in terms of picking at the right time. So it's a great area that's still focused on balance and purity. Let's go back quickly before we move to wine too. Um, 
you know, obviously your, your numbers speak as they speak. And those token numbers are um, probably eye popping for some people. Some people are probably nodding their head because they're really into it. Um, what is your, you've been working with this campaign for a while now. What is your perception, um, particularly, I mean, not so much the trade level, we all know, but as you're talking with consumers, um, are they are they like jaw dropping when they're finding these wines, expecting them all to be sweet? Are they, what's the reception been to this sort of troken, um, to a lesser degree, have troken category? It's kind of an about face. They really just stop in their tracks. They look, their jaw drops. They they say, I don't think I've ever had anything quite like this from Germany. And I say, good, it's a great discovery then. I'm glad to show you. And so sometimes I have to back into it with a grape like Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, that's a little more familiar because they already have this notion that Riesling is going to be sweet. Mm -hmm. If I come at them from a different grape, show the dry wines, then I can sneak a dry Riesling in and say, hey, here's an example that you didn't believe existed. How amazing is this? That's how do, I go about it. And do you find, um, well, we'll talk a little bit about Pinot Blanc in just a few minutes, but have you found like with that, you know, I mean, obviously Riesling, great people have that sort of sugar uh, association, but with a grape like Pinot Blanc, you know, again, if you're going off of a more non-Germanic counterpart, are, do people go in and when they taste a dry Weisberg Lender, are they surprised it's not sweet? Were they actually expecting it to be sweet? They were expecting it to have some sweetness because of, quote, Germany. So I think that it's good to get out of the mold of just Riesling with Germany, that mm -hmm. other varieties exist and that those varieties are dry. And then, you know, pull them back into Riesling because normally they look at Riesling and they're like, wow, you know, that's a really great um, substitute for maybe when I get tired of my New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I'll switch and go to that dry Riesling. So mm -hmm. it's more of just getting them outside their comfort zone to discover what's really available. Absolutely. Absolutely. So glad. Well, let's talk a little bit about Rosé right now as we're enjoying our second glass. And this, you know, I kind of alluded to in my opening comments that this should not be a shocker if you've been spending any time there. Um, and it should not be a shocker to you that France is the largest producer of rosé globally. I don't need to tell anybody in this world, um, the, in this room, in the Zoom land, that, that rosé from uh, France accounts for, you know, not only 30% of all wines sold in France, but a significant chunk of rosé wines sold all around the world. And now a lot of that, yes, is Provençal rosé, but I think we do underappreciate and under um, think the um, incredible power of French rosé overall. It's a big category here and a big category of uh, wine in the United States. That is to say, French rosé specifically. Um, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, volumes and values uh, continue to grow um, exponentially, <laughs> it seems, over uh, every single year as rosé has sort of um, found its happy place as a permanent place. You know, I remember it was not that long ago, um, and I'm sure you do too, Laura, that rosé was basically um, pigeonholed in the warm weather times of the year. You'd enjoy it in the summer. And then when the weather started to cool off again, you'd switch back to your reds and wait till the spring started to get warm again. And then the rosé would come up there. But I think so many of us have really begun to appreciate, um, number one, the fact that rosé wines can be enjoyed with so many types of cuisine at so many occurrences, um, et cetera, that, that you should rethink that. And um, secondarily that, that, you know, again, it's weathers, it's not just, you know, warm, it's warm in the winter, it could be cool in the summer. I mean, so again, that sort of time honored calendaring, if you will, of a wine to a category doesn't work as well. In Bordeaux, uh, they've seen the production um, increase as well, uh, literally doubled, as you can say, in the last 10 years, now representing almost 5% of the production there. What's important to remember here is that the, there's not just sort of one style of rosé. I mean, clearly, traditional dry rosé wines do represent the lion's share of what's out there, but there are two categories. Uh, there is, of course, Clément de Bordeaux, which is sparkling wine, and, you know, a Part of that is rosé, but I think what times we occasionally forget this wonderful little category, it's getting smaller each year, but nevertheless, claret uh, is a delightful category. And it's really sort of, it's, it's not a red, it's not really a traditional pink, but it's sort of like a super dark pink style of wine, fuller in flavor, fuller in body, um, that sort of splits the difference between white and uh, red or rosé, I should say, in red and can be just enjoyable. Um, it actually is French in origin, the claret concept, not to be confused with the claret term with just a T that we use to discuss red wines with, um, originated um, specifically in the Côte de Bordeaux, they say, in a town called Quinsac, uh, they say, I don't know that for a fact, 
um, but nevertheless, it's there. And as you can see, you range in colors and styles. And what's interesting um, in Bordeaux today is that more and more producers are looking specifically about certain plots of their vineyard or certain um, portions of their harvest as being dedicated specifically for Bordeaux production rather than simply bleeding and sending off. Not to say that's a bad thing, it's a wonderful thing, but um, there's a whole rethink on that. So to that point, wine number two that you have in front of you uh, is a treat. Uh, this is uh, the rosé from uh, that great house in uh, Pesac Lyon, uh, Domaine de Chevalier. Domaine de Chevalier for many of us is of course known for their um, ex extremely wonderful white wine, their delightful red uh, too. But this rosé is perhaps again, not thought about so much. Going back to that slide about, you don't appreciate me, you don't remember that I'm here, but they've been making this wine um, for a long time, over two decades, as you can see. And they're beginning to rethink it. Um, it's an amazing uh, estate. It sits in this sort of interesting microclimate that that uh, protects them um, from extremes. So they don't have a lot of uh, fluctuation the way a lot of their other um, neighbors do. And uh, they're under the very uh, amazing hands, the good hands of Allstate, the good hands in this case of Olivier Bernard and his family since the 1980s who have been uh, leading the analogical um, charge there. Obviously they've got help from uh, Monsieur Derancourt who does a really good job too, but they are a very good family. Um, this sort of fits on that classic thing of the color being uh, slightly paler. Um, again, here, they're literally um, just doing a, a quick pull of the fruit. They, what I like about this wine is that the, the varieties are kept separately and then they blend back. So literally based on what the quality of the Cabernet plots and the Cabernet fruit is, or the quality of the Mare plot, low plots is, this is not gonna, um, gonna change every year. And, and what I don't know sheepishly, maybe you do, Laura, is whether this assemblage as we're seeing it here today is in fact, um, the vineyard plots that have been designated for rosé the way they're planted or whether this is the actual blend of the wine I would guess because it's rosé and it's not you know the big white or the big red probably has more to do with the specific wine but I don't know for fact do you do you I, know better I than me you're right on the specific wine uh, mm -hmm. simply because it's not obviously their focal point so it doesn't have the full stage, but they make a serious effort as you can taste. I mean, I just love the texture, the creaminess of it. Mm -hmm. um, exotic kind of red berry that there's so much to say. Um, and one little note, just so everyone's aware, um, I believe it's been two years now, but in France, rosé consumption surpassed white wine consumption, which is a crazy thought in its own right. I, I, as they said on that TV show once, I did not know that. That's, uh, that's extraordinary. And I think it probably echoes, you know, I mean, we, if you, I don't know where it is here, obviously rosé consumption is not going to overshadow white consumption here for a while, mainly because of Chardonnay, et cetera. But I know the numbers here have been, as the slide before showed, um, uh, bigger and bigger. And I think a lot of that is just the overall acceptance. I mean, it was not that long ago that rosé was something, again, not only weather there, but you know, it's like men didn't drink rosé wine and increasingly many of my best male friends are drinking more rosé than a lot of my female friends are. So there, a lot of the categories that we thought of as being traditionally applicable to this category are being completely um, explosive and thought of differently than they were before. All right, let's move on to our next pair of wines here. Oh, well, before this, there needs to be a horse, right? Domaine du Chevalier, you've got to have a, a horse in the vineyards here. And I don't think that's horse plowing, like we would see in the Malay or maybe Northern Washington, Eastern Washington, but nevertheless, uh, Chevalier obviously refers to the fact that there used to be um, horse stables and, uh, you know, and associated with that vineyard. So, all right, this is a slide that I know is near and dear to your heart. And, and I think this is one that we, we, we kind of know, but we don't really talk about it as much as we should. And this is in fact, the next generation. Um, you can call them avant-garde. You can call them the cutting edge, the leading edge, the young guns, um, whatever you want to do it. Although I put that bullet point though um, down that age is really not a determining factor in all this. It's not really relative. Um, I think you put out of that, um, Lisa, but the picture up in the upper right-hand corner um, is a metaphor <laughs> for what's going on there. And clearly some of the the folks that are there too. What are some of your thoughts on, on this um, and, and how do you view the importance and the influence of this next gen um, being um, permeating itself in, in both markets? So I definitely feel that there's this connection to understanding we've got to take care of our planet. We must be responsible for our actions. And I love it that there's this pressure to expect more protect more 
and act responsibly. So it's filtering in, it's setting an example. It's not just in only the planet, it's in the styles, the balance, um, you know, natural wines. We could go down the rabbit hole and discussing all the fun that's going on there. I would love to just point out that, again, age is not determining in that situation because I was just on a webinar last week where we had a young lady who was 50. She just started this in 2018, a small venture in Cadillac, and she loved the fact that Bordeaux categorized her as the next gen. So we're seeing this from every angle, and I just think it's uh, an incredible force, a tour de force to lead region and country forward with Germany and Bordeaux. It's, it's interesting when you mention that, and, and I, I smile when I hear that because I remember when my mother opened up Square One, her first restaurant at the age of 50 as well too. So age shouldn't always be a determining factor and it is relative within the context of it. But, but where do you feel like, I mean, I'm just looking at some of these pictures at the bottom here. Um, you know, some of these uh, are, are just simply next generations of existing families. What are your thoughts on um, how in multi-generational family uh, situations you're seeing this affected? Is it because the younger guard are simply young, younger, maybe pushing it back against their, uh, their prior generations? Is it because they've traveled more? Is it because their palates are broader? What do you think it is um, specifically generationally before we talk about some of the other stuff in, um, in these areas? I honestly feel that whether good or bad, this climate shift is allowing them to open themselves up to styles, production, uh, techniques, and they're starting to question what has been in existence for, you know, the last two generations. They taste with their friends. They have, you know, in events and, and gatherings where they learn and they talk, and they all have this really incredible uh, power of thought and what they want, and they're not going to stop at anything to get there. They're mm -hmm. testing everything. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what's important to note too is that it's not just the winemakers themselves. You know, it's it's the viticulture people, it's the owners of, of of chateaus, it's it's new or estates in Germany. It's you know everyone's coming in, and be they young or be they old, they're helping to sort of reshape or recreate this new impression. Of a of particular category. Now, granted, by sheer numbers and sheer energy, youth often will dominate an element here. And I, I bring everybody's attention to that uh, little uh, logo at the bottom, the Arom de Jeunesse. And this is an interesting website. If you go there, you know, in your copious free time, but spend some time there. There's a group of uh, of a dozen or so producers in Bordeaux specifically who are are standing up, they say they're pushing back, whatever that means, uh, to a degree against in a different style, to, to um, paraphrase you, Laura, and showing what they've experienced, what they know, but they specifically reference um, their travels, their stages abroad, their different experiences in helping take um, other thoughts, traditional, non-traditional, in a traditional area thoughts, and bringing them in to an area that perhaps didn't um, know about it before. And before we leave uh, Bordeaux and, and go to the next photo, because I think that's an interesting one for you to talk about, is this idea that I remember um, when I was going around uh, the market or talking with a few people on a webinar, but also talking with a few people in markets as I'd begun to gradually, slowly travel out again, very slowly, but traveling out nevertheless. Um, and you talk to people, particularly younger buyers, about Bordeaux. You know, I have such you know, I cut my teeth on Bordeaux. I am the old caricature of the guy in that second slide. But for a lot of younger people, Bordeaux is actually a discovery category for them because they're coming to the category through people like Arom de Jeunesse or through people who have a very young uh, perception about wine and helping shape that at least um, on, on that end, which I thought was quite interesting. But beyond the Grande de Jeunesse, they're just, you know, they're an example of a group that's out there. There's a lot of groups out there in these areas that are sort of pushing these sort of newer avant-garde approaches. And I thought this was a fabulous um, a slide. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about this. Yes. So this uh, Generation Riesling, it, you know, we feel like it's been a few years, but notice it started in 2006. So we're 15 years into it now. And their point was to really kind of embrace the younger generation and let them feel like they had a, a net, um, a networking group to kind of foster a discussion and camaraderie. 
But what they realized is they were starting a movement by making wine cool again, making the thought of being involved in that uh, not some older style of trade where a lot of the young generation were, of, you know, thinking of leaving and becoming a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, trying to draw back in this uh, respect for making extraordinary wines working with this. So I think that was the original mission. It has exploded. Uh, this is now kind of at the helm in terms of social events and calendar events, and it drives a lot of attention. And I believe that they, you know, worthwhile, they do benefit from this exposure and pushing the styles in a modern sense. Yeah, uh, and, and, and I don't know for a fact, and maybe we'll have to ask him at some point in time, he's closer to you physically than he is to me, but you would think that, that something like this that goes back either was echoed by, amplified by, inspired by, or he was inspired by, so I think of somebody like um, Paul Greco over at Terroir in the summer of Riesling and all of that is, has become, but you know, you see pictures of this and you realize that number one, it didn't start in New York with Paul, um, but number two, that there has been this, no pun intended, ferment uh, there. What would be interesting to understand in this, and you know, I, I'm sure there's no legal definition as there is in viticulture, but what is the what is the definition of a young winemaker these days? Because I, I look back on what you were just saying. You have somebody who's 50 years old and just putting their feet there. I wonder if you know it's like what is the definition of an old vine or whatever. But um, I do think that it's certainly youthfully inspired um, and um, and uh, youthfully uh, driven. But uh, it's really cool. And uh, Generation Riesling, Arom de Jeunesse. We have all of these. Uh, elements going on here. An ambition to also push for change. And again, coming back to this focus on respect and responsibility for your actions in terms of everyone around you, nature, that is implied as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're we'll definitely going to be spending a chunk of time on that in our, our next duet. But um, we're going to now, one by, after the other, be, um, be joined by a couple of our Vintner friends there, but we'll introduce the wines and then hand it over to all of them. Let's kick off uh, with our Weisberg under our, our Pinot Blanc. So please, uh, Laura, take this one away. Yes, I just keep putting my nose in the glass and it really is just so pretty. Um, you know, Pinot Blanc is one of my absolute favorite varieties. And I will be honest, I've never tasted better Pinot Blanc outside of Germany. It's just one of the greatest gifts that Germany has. And, you know, we're still with consumers trying to get them to understand, wow, this is clean. It's um, refreshing in style. It's not heavy. It's not like Chardonnay, um, when I mean Chardonnay oaked and slightly different. So it's, it's a learning lesson. It's a learning curve, but I really never see any guest that tastes it and doesn't say, wow, I love that. I want to look for that. I've got to find that wine or at least something similar. So I think that's the, the fun surprise here with this. Absolutely. And we're very lucky to have uh, Lisa Neubauer with us have, of the winery, literally just coming off of harvest. I think they were having harvest close today. We were chatting earlier on. And Lisa, you want to join us? Um, Hi. And, hey, how are you? I finished my harvest beer and you finished your harvest beer and you're back to wine. I would tell people I'm back that, to Pinot Blanc. So right, it worked. There you go. What what can you tell us about this uh, amazing estate, about this wine we have in front of us, and uh, about how it how it um, um, conflates with this new um, next gen thing we're talking about? Um, it's funny. We talked. Uh, I talked with Christian, our winemaker, about the next gen, and he was like laughing. And we remembered when we were on a fair, and he was standing next to me with his long rasters, and me with my short red hair. And he was like, "Fuck up, next gen. We just look like this." Um, <laughs> for us, it's the most important thing to impress what we want to have in our glass. So when we were uh, in Burgundy, my family comes from France. Um, Christian studied in Burgundy, he was in Bordeaux, and he was like, I have to get some new incentions. And you talked about it earlier when you said it's about they want to find out why they question what happens now, what was, what was uh, built during all of these ages, but they want to know why. And for us in the south of Germany, it's always been a bit of a struggle because everyone knows that they we've got a history, we've got the history of all these drinking uh, grannies and uh, uh, our grandpas who love wine in our region, but it was classic that there's only a liter of wine and nothing special. So we had to develop our own style and we decided to not make a handwriting out of own varieties, but 
to focus on our soils. We get so many great soils and so, so many mineralic styles that you can really develop a Pinot Blanc with a fruity nose, but with a crispy style, which is refreshing, which is lightened, which is straight. Um, that's something that really points out our, um, our varieties here in, in Württemberg. All, anyone uh, can say that uh, we have got so many problems with uh, sweet wine, problems, we call it problems, because for us in our region or in whole Germany, sweet wines are really not that big. And for us, and everyone drinks dry wines. We just switch to more fruity bodied white wines or to really mineralic dry white wines. And when we're talking about Pinot Blanc, we have the possibility here in the south of Germany to develop two different varieties. One Pinot Blanc can be mineralic and pure and straight, and the other one can be like a bouquet of flowers, and you can just smell like it. There are so many wines you can just decide to, huh, I can smell it for like three hours a day. Um, okay, I prefer drinking it. I hope this is a problem. <laughs> Um, but when I first drank a wine from Christian, I was working as a salmon in some Michelin set restaurants in the south of Germany. And he showed me a Chardonnay. And I was like, okay, it's another um, Chardonnay, buttery, classic in Germany. It's a bit more heavy bodied. And he said, no, it's a Chardonnay I want to like to drink. And that's what explains this, uh, the winemaking in the south of Germany, in Württemberg, that we go focused, that we go straight, that we look at our fathers and mothers and say, okay, you develop this and I can focus your opinion. And I think that's about talking about the next generation because a generation can only be a next generation when we learned about well, from something from our parents. And that's what Christian always uh, decided to show because his father was a rebellion, planting Chardonnay was prohibited in the south of Germany in the 70s. And he's just like, okay, let's try. He tried it and we've got the most of the best Chardonnays now in Germany. Christian decided just to, okay, I don't want this presented oak. If I'm working with oak or with, uh, with varieties, I want minerality and purity. Okay, it's not common, but let's do it. And I think this is the way uh, new generations, especially in the south of Germany, like Generation Riesling we are in, um, was really something special for all of us. And I think it was the most uh, um, impressive way of working with Christian, standing in our winery in the cellar. Uh, we made a cuvee of uh, different Pinot Blancs and he was like, okay, what do you want to do? And I said like, I want to open a bottle and I want to say yes. And I think the best bottle you have with Pinot Blanc is when you have one glass and the bottle is empty and you wonder why. And I think we achieved this already in Germany and in Germany in different regions, they have all the same style of us. They know we want to drink dry wines, trocken is our, it's, it's normal. It's something you really want to, sweet wines is for dessert. The others yeah. is what we drink. I have, I have a question for you. And ask me. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> I am, I'm gonna ask you. So, so Lisa would, um, you know, uh, and I think Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, not if I'm wrong here. But you know, when we say Germany, Württemberg isn't the first place that pops out of our, our nah, mouth. You know, no. and is is is, um, is Württemberg a um, a crucible for a lot of what is going on with this next gen, with this new new approach and all that? Is it really a um, a shining light, a north star appellation within Germany for this so called new Germany next gen? It is because of one big reason. Every region in Germany has their starlights. It's the soil, it's the region, it's Mosel, Pfalz. We all know the are because of, of Schieferitz. Everything is common because of their region. Württemberg is common because of their styles. And I think if you can, if you can talk about a wine, it's not important that it comes from Württemberg or from Baden or from whatever region of Germany. If you can feel the soil, if you can taste where it comes from, I don't care if it comes from the north or the south. If I can relay on, I'm sitting on the top of our of our best hill here at exactly the Wurmberg. If I'm sitting there drinking our Riesling or Schadling, which is cultivated there since the 70s, um, I don't care. But if there's someone talking about Mosul or Pfalz, I'm like having a glass of wine, enjoying it. And this could, should all be the focus that Württemberg is focused on their 
their territory, their, their soils, their people, of course. And if you're not focused on people and their, and their environment, you cannot do great wines. Laura, anything you to add or question? I will or? just give a shout out to Württemberg. Some of the best, I won't say the best, but pushing the best uh, top Limburger I've ever had, Grossesgewex level, comes from Württemberg. So there's so much, some of the greatest Grossesgewex Riesling, when, when many say, oh, Württemberg can't produce great Riesling. Oh, trust me. There's so much here that it's just super fun. There's um, Pinot Meunier that's around too. There's all kinds of experimental production going on. That's what I love about Württemberg is there's usually a surprise right around the corner that you never expected that shows you Germany can extend to this. But I, when I'm, I, I'm, as I'm enjoying my last sips of this wine before, um, before we move on and, and thanking you. Lisa, by the way, will hang out. She'll be with us at the end for Q&A. She'll be with us for half the half hour and all that other good stuff. Is, um, you know, this wine has this wonderful, I mean, first of all, the, the, um, the, the, the uh, electricity on this wine is a 2017 is um, mind numbing. I mean, it's just I'm so jealous. fresh. I'm jealous we don't have any bottle in our winery. I searched through the whole <laughs> cellar and oh. I talked to Christian. He said like, oh my God, 17? No, of course not. Oh. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> The, fr the freshness on this wine, I, I'm sure you would echo it, Laura, is just impeccable. But what I love here is you've got that bright, um, crisp framework, yet the palate has a, a smoothness and a creaminess to it that is just delightful. And I'm, I'm taken by a phrase that you said, what do you want in this wine? Uh, you, you said, I want to say yes. And I pick up this wine and I go, yes. I mean, this is exactly what it said. So I, I, I'm going to steal that one from you uh, moving forward, no Lisa, but I prom prom promise you, I will always give you credit. Thank you so much for this. Again, uh, Lisa will join us a little bit later as we move on. I think that gives us one angle of it. Obviously, we want to shift over to our friends now down in southwestern France and talk a little bit about uh, the Bordeaux side of this. And for this, we're going to enter with the Bordeaux Blanc, uh, not necessarily a Bordeaux Rouge. We'll talk about a little bit about that later, but Chateau Autrion and, uh, or Orion. Um, and this is a, you know, a white, white Bordeaux wines Bordeaux are... Wines are a little bit underappreciated in, in my in my esteem in terms of how many incredible ones out there. We talked about Domaine de Chevalier and their leading incredible one later, but there's so many other delightful examples of it, of which this wine uh, that we're having from Pauline is um, just a, a lovely example of a nice blend of uh, Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, um, little time on the lees, no oak whatsoever, very um, manageable uh, price, I might add, too. And looking at the wine, you know, in a new way. Again, uh, managing 87 plots individually, not looking at just the whole property of let's go pick here today and there tomorrow, but literally micro focusing it down that way and, um, and looking at it in, you know, shorter macerations, less oak than perhaps people are, are used to. Um, and all that other good stuff. And we are lucky. I'm not going to talk about the wine when I'm blessed to have Pauline Lapierre Dietrich with us today. Pauline, if you could join us, tell us a little bit about your wine, about you, about how this all fits together in this new avant-garde of uh, what we're seeing in Bordeaux. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Pauline um, uh, from uh, Bordeaux, as you said, Chateau Rion. Uh, so the wine you are having uh, today is a blend in Bordeaux. Uh, um, even if uh, the next gen uh, is uh, trying more and more to make some um, uh, single uh, uh, grape variety um, wines, uh, blends remain uh, something uh, very uh, important uh, in our culture, let's say. Um, it's a 60% uh, Sémillon, 40% Sauvignon Blanc, and it's vintage 2019. 2019 was a uh, a fabulous vintage for whites, especially, um, because we had um, very dry weather, um, which meant dry, uh, sorry, ripe, uh, uh, nice ripeness and uh, semillon. Uh, and what was uh, very striking as well was the um, level of acidity. Actually, everything uh, got concentrated in the grapes. Uh, so we had this nice ripeness together with uh, a nice acidity. So we have uh, like full ripe whites, uh, but fresh whites as well in uh, 2019. Yeah, and personally, so I'm uh, 
Inologist. Uh, I grew up uh, here uh, in uh, in this uh, estate, uh, and then I actually I decided to study uh, finance and uh, worked a few years in Singapore before realizing I really wanted to be uh, an inologist. Uh, so I um, I came back, uh, passed my degree, uh, and uh, started to work uh, here five years ago. This, you would be a perfect person to ask something we had talked about a little bit earlier. Obviously, um, first of all, working in family businesses is never obvious, right? There's all the familial sorts of things. How did you take up um, you, your father has his ways of making wine and stuff like that? You come on, you've taken over the winemaking for your father. Talk to us a little bit about um, are, what are you doing the same? Obviously, same property, same grapes. What sort of changes have you implemented? How has he responded? Um, and then obviously, how has the public responded to the changes you've made? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, firstly, I think the range is, uh, so I uh, fully admire what uh, they've done. So I must say they um, they bought the estate and they settled. So it's not, uh, we don't have uh, uh, 30 generations uh, before. So it makes uh, things, I think, a bit uh, easier, maybe. Um, so actually, what uh, what uh, happened is that uh, the core range they built uh, is still on, and uh, um, I really um, uh, value, uh, for example, the wine we have in the glass uh, today, uh, because they are balanced. They uh, answer to. Uh, let's say uh, what uh, a wine from this appellation should be, uh, a Bordeaux Blanc. Um, but uh, so when I arrived, I think they were selling uh, five wines. Uh, five years later, we have now 10 wines to uh, in our range. Meaning, and it's not only me, I think it's really something uh, the next generation uh, is uh, uh, trying to focus on. Um, historically, I think Bordeaux uh, built itself on uh, one chateau with uh, a vineyard and uh, it was the wine of the chateau. And uh, nowadays, uh, the new generation is more and more focused on uh, plots and uh, terroirs, as you mentioned. Uh, so um, uh, I personally uh, make now four uh, plot selections uh, with specific interest on uh, uh, this uh, wine comes from this uh, plot and uh, for me it's very important and I think um, for the next generation as well the vintage effect um, maybe it was something uh, that my father used to um, stabilize or erase trying to make something uh, 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 consistent like to, to cope with uh, to cope with the vintage and to try to manage it in the cellar uh, whereas I'm uh, more um, accepting in a way uh, what the vintage uh, says if it makes sense interesting I think the fact that you're, you know, it, it, I mean, again, the whole idea is to explode people's heads today, but the fact that you're making 10 different wines, you know, the idea of a property, a single property, I mean, a negociant, of course, bien sûr, right? But a single property coming off with so many different cuvées and taking, at, at the risk of, of saying something, maybe I should, but oh, it's, it's almost, dare I say, a Burgundian approach that your plot specific and I literally, this soil is slightly different or this plot is coming off different, even though it's on the same estate. Um, it, it, it's taking a very different approach to the point of literally, you know, um, looking at the what does Autrion represent? What is our style of wine? How do we do this? Which might have been more of your father's approach. Is that a fair assessment? Do you think? Yes, I I, uh, I agree with you. But uh, so I uh, would never dare to compare uh, with uh, Burgundy. But um, I think for long, uh, Bordeaux um, uh, didn't. Uh, we always had those beautiful uh, plots everywhere uh, in Bordeaux, uh, and uh, but we were not uh, talking about it. 
Whereas uh, nowadays, uh, for example, I'm part of the Cadillac Côte de Bordeaux. Uh, this is the name of the AOP. And um, as a union of rain growers, we decided uh, four months ago uh, to, to make a bit, to put a bit of money to make a um, detailed plot of the soils and terroirs of uh, our appellation, which is, and this was brought by uh, a few uh, young wine growers willing to know more about, uh, in details about uh, our soils. And um, this is completely, yeah, true. Everyone knew we had a good terroirs, but we are more and more to, to focus uh, on them. Plus, I would say in my specific region of Cadillac Côte de Bordeaux, it's mostly uh, still uh, small family run uh, estates. Uh, and uh, people who are uh, really, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, wine uh, wine growers uh, before being uh, winemakers mm -hmm. so i think this uh, this focus on uh, terroirs is even more uh, important connection to the earth connection to the earth and then lastly and then i'm sorry for jump laura you should feel the jump in and interrupt me anytime you want you know the, the on the slide earlier we talked about um you know shorter maceration times less oak and things like that is that something that you talked to your father against doing did you simply do it did he suggest it was it a cooperative thing or is that and is that something one is seeing again typically across uh, greater areas that people are opting for shorter macerations, less oak, et cetera, as they, as they enter the market. Yes. Uh, no. Uh, so most of the time we cooperate. Uh, I, I won't hide that sometimes we fight, uh, but um, I think uh, for shorter macerations, there's no uh, real uh, uh, topic. Uh, on one side, we have the climate change, which uh, completely changed the profiles of the uh, ripeness of the grapes, especially for the Merlot, which is uh, the widest, uh, the most important grape variety in our region. Um, and on the other side, you have the, the demand of, and of the young uh, consumers, which are obviously uh, much more into uh, uh, fruits uh, and uh, uh, delicate uh, delicate tannins uh, than in uh, uh, big uh, extracted uh, wines. Laura, anything you wanna? Yes, I'd love to add that it's fun for both these wines that we've had in this second round. I've had exposure um, prior to the pandemic with seminars and events in the US. So I've been with Pauline at another event and just was mesmerized by her semillon. It just really reminded me that there's so much still that Bordeaux has to kind of question and push towards. And there are amazing options for semillon dominated whites that we don't normally think about. And this little teaser of the Bordeaux Blanc with a little more proportion of semillon is a great example. So um, Pauline, always a treat to taste these extraordinary wines. Thanks, Laura. Great, and again, Pauline. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Pauline will be with us. Uh, as we move, as we enter the Q and A and move into our happy half hour afterwards, but boy, I, this, this, the tasting here is building on strength on the strength on the strength, and we're going to enter our last duet here, and um, I think it's an important one, and um, we should go ahead and talk about it. I'm going to move over to the next slide here and ask you. You brought this phrase up, which I just thought was brilliant, um, Laura. Why don't you talk to people a little bit about what do you mean by eco thrust, and why is it so um, seminally um, represented within this these two areas? I think it's just incredible to see this progress of what we experience in Germany and Bordeaux in terms of the push for uh, respect to the environment, the eco-friendly, the certifications. I'll tell you in both, they look at this as let's all get on board in whatever capacity we can. It's not about a contest, okay, I'm gonna try to achieve biodynamics over organics. It's let's start with sustainability and then maybe that leads to the push of organic. Small steps create great progress. And it is a team oriented approach. It's going on in astronomical terms right now. We need it, we need this thrust. It is a thrust, I feel it. It's 
always spoken about when you travel there um, and you speak with them, they will let you know. So that's where that premise came. I love it. And when we talk about EcoThrust, and we'll move into another slide momentarily to speak about some specifics and show some uh, some numbers that are, again, sort of jaw dropping when you think about the totality of them. When you've spent time with them, with these folks, Laura, when they talk about EcoThrust, is it really something that's, that's, that's vineyard and vineyard driven? Is it in the winemaking? Is it in labor issues? We talked about the social elements of uh, sustainability and all that today. How do you see it playing out um, more holistically? It is amazing. It encompasses it all. And honestly, many of them speak first. Well, if we think about it just in a realistic sense, we have to take care of where we live and how that impacts ourselves, our families and others. Mm -hmm. Then they go into quality of wine and all that, but they realize what they affect directly affects everything else. So it's important. It is wound up but very much the social part is a thrust of that aspect. Yeah, I, I think you're seeing um, so much more of that uh, in Europe in general, you know, that they're really, um, they're, they're taking on an understanding, you know, not only the carbon, the viticulture stuff, but the carbon footprints. You know, we talk about, especially right now with transit and supply chain and how we do, I mean, all of these things play together and obviously taking care of one's people is a big piece too. Um, I wanna throw up some numbers here with respect to the trending of green here. And let me take on, take on the Bordeaux piece and then um, Laura, please jump in on, on Germany. But um, the, the numbers in Bordeaux are, 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 are again, sort of awesome. And there's two sort of studies that I think are worth um, noting here that build into these numbers. The first one is called Agence Bio and obviously Agence Bio focuses in, it's a French organization that looks a, a lot at what's going on um, in bio, in uh, bio, if you will, there. And there was literally from year to year, from 19 to 20, there was a 43% jump in the amount of Bordeaux vineyard that was either certified as organic or in conversion to organic over time. And when you think about that, that's just, you know, that's phenomenal given once again, yes, it's a region, but this is a region that produces more wine than many countries do. That many, and for, to have that level of commitment that's incredible. And our friends over at the, uh, at the uh, CIVB uh, noted the first figure that you see there that 75% of Bordeaux's vineyards now have, uh, have undertaken a certified environmental approach, which is up for 55% since 2016, uh, with obviously goal, the goal being and a stated uh, audacious goal, I would say, of 100% uh, involvement in due time, which, you know, once they achieve that, for an area, again, as timeless and historic and as leading as Bordeaux is, that's a, a pretty amazing uh, place to, to be. Now, 1,500 properties so far have, uh, have certified HEV uh, or HVE, I should say, and for those people that don't know what HVE is, is once that you've attained the third and what they call the most stringent level of the certification process, you, you, you get this title. And we would call it, which is why I said HEV, high inventor, environmental value. They would call it haute valeur environmentale. So you flip the V and your E, um, which is more than any other French region at this stage. And obviously based on some of the numbers uh, I shared with you before is only moving upwards there. So, so true leaders in this, in this green movement. And over in Germany? Yes, and the trend is moving in that way as well. And so we know that there's always been a trend in the southern portion of Germany, um, especially in the zones that have that rain shadow effect, Alsace, Baden. Baden had uh, the largest holdings of organic vineyards, probably, I won't say in Europe and stretch it, but close. So it's no surprise. What is important to keep in mind is though, even with these erratic vintages that we see, and the growers will be the first to tell you, you know, it's schizophrenia, literally from one year to the next, we don't know what to expect. But when you embark on nature, nature becomes your largest support system in terms of fending off the defenses you need to tackle what you don't expect. So that is the beauty that, they're on this mission. They realize that they've got to arm themselves by aligning with the environment. It's their best response, if you will, to the undulations. So, um, you know, I don't need to reiterate the slide, but it is in constant movement. Um, this is across all regions, even in some of the areas where you think you wouldn't expect. Let's say Mosul, for instance, even in Mosul, some of the climate shift there involves um, irrigation 
believe it or not, because we have such dramatic swings. So no regions off the table in terms of approach with organic sustainability and biodynamic. Yeah, and I think it's so important what you say, Laura, is about you know this 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 constant sense that we are in a very fluid, very iterative uh, stage in in rethinking the way we do all things like that. And thank goodness for that. And also because you know not only is it quote unquote the right thing to do, which it is. But also, I think consumers and all of us who love wine are demanding it more uh, of everybody, are demanding it more um, for those of you who make wine of yourselves, for those of us who consume and recommend wine of, of, of the vintners there. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually just sort of dizzied by the sheer volume of organizations, as you can see there at the bottom of the chart that have sort of um, become benchmarks for all of this and and um, and led with all this. But obviously, it would be inappropriate to talk about this without having a couple of glasses of wine and uh, keeping up with our, our, our back and forth here. Why don't you kick us off with this uh, delightful German uh, Pinot that we have in front of us? So I just put my nose in it. It's all about this incredible fresh Bing cherry, that little bit of rose, rose hip, potpourri, whatever you want to call it. And that edge of forest floor is just so pretty though. That's what I love about this. I hadn't even tasted it. I just kept putting my nose in it, but I'm going to keep sipping it and just let you know that, you know, the Becker property I've, I've known it for quite some time now for almost 10 years and they just keep, you know, pushing the needle in terms of quality and caliber and what they do. And there is no expense spared for that association with the environment. 70% of their vineyards are on the French side. So it's kind of funny, it goes back historically, they had to sell some water rights to keep the use of Germany on their label. But it is this style that is fresh, precise, Pinot Noir, uh, they produce Riesling, Pinot Blanc, um, so very high levels of Spaberg under, single cask. Many of those casks get sold off to clients in Japan and China. We don't see them in the United States, but they are trying to compete with Burgundy. That was their competition in their mind. I love it because I think there's a lot of Burgundian essence in the style. It represents the area, not just faults, but a lot of the state Burgundy production across Germany. I think a lot of people, if you were to, I mean, for those of you who did this blind, I mean, granted, you knew we were in Bordeaux in Germany and it wasn't going to be Burgundy or something else. But I think for, again, breaking paradigms, if you had said German Pinot Noir, Spätburgunder, to people several years ago, they would have thought things that were sort of lighter in, in, in personality and all that. This is a really serious wine. And I might add a wine with some age on it. I know. And that's what's so fun is you don't realize it. Um, there's this freshness still that exists, this purity of fruit. And look at 15. It was touted as a warm vintage. There's nothing that feels hot about this at all. So it is fun. I think the winemakers know that. They're working to contend with the undulations in each vintage. Mm -hmm. So I just, hats off. Uh, Spapergunder is really one of my passions. I love to shock consumers and clients with it. Let me ask you this, and if you don't know the answer, you can you can say so. But um, clearly, they've made a deliberate effort to call it Pinot Noir and not call it Spätburgunder. Is there anything you can share with us that you know about that, or is that just simply a, a, again understanding the French element of it, or what's the it, reason? It is trying to connect again with that Burgundian counterpart to, you know, lose that misnomer of German style wine and more Pinot Noir, uh, compete with Burgundy, compete with New World, you know, Oregon, that the majority of their clients are export clients except for cellar door sales. And this is a, a, a picture here. What a gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Absolutely, absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous. Absolutely amazing. All right. Well, let us, uh, let us finish. Let's stay on our, our red wine thing and let's wheel our way back on a a fast train to where we were before. And we're in uh, Saint-Emilion specifically uh, with a very traditionally made wine, uh, Chateau Coutet, not to be confused with Chateau Coutet over in Sauterne, Barsac area, folks. Um, it's funny, you know, when you, I was trying to do some lookup stuff and I was actually surprised that I, it wasn't until my third page on searching that this wine actually came up. Everything prior to that was in sweet wine. So um, just, uh, 
uh, note to self, don't judge a book by its cover or in this case, its particular name. Um, nothing sort of surprising in terms of either the blend nature of it, maybe the Malbec's a little bit of a surprise for some people in this part of the world, but the uh, that sort of uh, core aggregate blend of Merlot and Cabernet Franc uh, is doing it. What's interesting about this property, which I did not know, but speaks very much to um, the theme of what we had been talking about with EcoThrust is that they've never, um, use chemicals at all. You know, so much of uh, traditional parts of the world in order to keep soil healthy, used to resort to uses of chemicals. Obviously that's tapered back globally, not any everywhere, but this place from the day they got started, um, they've done that. They've only worked with uh, mass selection for the replantings, again, preserving the personality of place and all that and making sure they can keep their juice to skin, you know, clearly their thicker skin, um, uh, selections that they've got there, horse trod, uh, as opposed to that. So, you know, maybe, maybe they borrowed that horse from Domaine de Chevalier. We just don't know. Wild tulips that go back to the Romans, just, um, an extraordinary, uh, story, a delicious wine, I might add too. And one for, um, those folks who actually can get to page three or four of that Google search, will find that it's been highly well recognized, um, by people who recognize these sorts of things. But rather than hearing from me, um, and before I turn it over to uh, to Laura, we're we're uh, going to take a look at that vineyard. You can see those horses going out there and uh, trotting away there and helping uh, keep the land um, uh, natural and uh, the, the plowing natural as well too. But we're lucky enough to have uh, the two uh, brothers uh, who are with us here today to join us from the vineyard. So I'm going to click on this. Hope the audio works well. And uh, we are joined here by uh, Matthew and uh, Adrien David Beaulieu. Hello, we are the David Beaulieu cousins, Mathieu and Adrien. Hi. We are together in charge of Coutet, our family estate. And uh, Coutet is a special chateau in saint emilion Special chateau because of many reasons. But the two, three most important reasons are first, we are the same family since a little bit more than four centuries. The second reason is Coutet has always been organic growing. It means we never use weed killer, insecticides, and pesticides. And the third reason is with, we still grow the historical grape varieties of the modern one, of the common one everybody grows in the southwest part of France. I mean, we grow red-tailed Merlot, ancest local ancestor of the common Merlot, but also Bouchette, the common ancestor of the Cabernet Franc, and the Pressac, the ancestor of the Malbec. And this year, is a very special vintage. 2021 was affected by frost, by hail, by mildew, and most of the winemakers in France were very, very impacted by all those terrible events. And here we are actually quite happy because we just finished harvest yesterday. Yesterday was the last day, and actually we maybe lost 20, 25% of the total production, and thanks to the historical grape varieties we grow. Actually, those grape varieties are not coming from clones. The selection of those plants is from our eyes, like our ancestors did before. So when we want to plant a new field, we select the strongest branches from the oldest plant from our oldest field in our family estate. So we have a continuity of the DNA since centuries and centuries. So we are less affected by some climatic events like frost, like this year. I mean, this year was affected in April by a terrible frost. Most of the fields of the vineyard in France were affected because the bud break is most of the times very, very uh, in advance. But here, as we still grow the historical grape varieties, our bud break is always late. So when the frost uh, impacts our vineyard in the middle of April, we have nothing to frost because our historical grape varieties get a memory DNA and to protect themselves in case of a climatic accidents, they are late. So we have nothing to frost. So thanks to that, we did a nice harvest. And it's this year something very specific. So we are very happy about that and we wanted to share, to share this with you. And I also would like to add in 2017, the same problem affect our vineyard. 17 vintage in Bordeaux was terrible. 85% of the production of saint emilion was destroyed because of hail. And we, have not we were not impacted by hail. Also because of the DNA from, from our old plants. 
So I think it could be maybe a new way to be less affected by frost. We wish you a good day. All right. Hello, we are oh. David Beaulieu. <laughs> I love the roosters in the background too. That was a, uh, a nice touch. What commitment, what enthusiasm, and what a connection um, to everything they were doing. Just before I, I, I explain this slide here, any, any thoughts on, on the wine or the gentleman at uh, speaking, Laura? Oh, I just love the effort and the focus and the steadfast perseverance. I think it's incredible. The wine's extraordinary. It just jumps out of the glass. It's just so easy to enjoy. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I do think, and maybe it's the um, process, the, what is it, the product of suggestion of being led a little bit, uh, the, leading the witness, but there is a depth and a profondeur of this wine and a, uh, a precision that, that literally you can taste the fact that this has been gone on, not only from generation, but literally that the budwood that has given birth there has just gotten, you know, stronger in what it is, is they've made the best selections massively from the oldest stocks and all that. Just an extraordinary wine. I hope everybody out there in Zoom land is enjoying it as much in, as Laura and I have. And I just wanted to kind of finish up here, get Laura, get some thoughts from you before we um, open it up for some Q&A. And I put this slide up here very deliberately. Um, and this goes back to what we spoke about at the beginning in terms of, you know, uh, preceding ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And there's an old expression, you know, made, made, made popular by the advertising uh, agencies of years ago, you know, have you driven a Ford lately? And I think that that um, is so true today. And you could say that about Germany, you could say that about Bordeaux in the sense that, yeah, I mean, up in the upper right hand uh, corner there, yeah, that's the Ford of then, but the Ford of now um, as down in the bottom with, you know, sleek design and technology driven and some of the most highly rated cars in the market, forget the American market, also in the global market, you know, they have literally re-imaged, rebranded, rethought, reapproached, reconnected, um, if you will, in a different way there. So, um, you know, back to the future, I guess, still lives in many things today, which leads um, me into the sort of expect the, uh, the unexpected. I think you said that, Laura. And, and I, I do believe that, that, that what's old and longstanding in terms of histories and traditions, timeless legacy reputations that were earned for reasons are still the foundations by which great spots such as Bordeaux and, and Germany exist today. But what is also wonderful about them is there's so much new. And what is old is at once new, but also new is evolving there. Thoughts, Laura? Well, I really won't belabor it, but I just encourage those that have the ability to you know, offer these incredible styles to their clients, their consumers, guests, uh, to revisit this for your list because they really shock a lot of consumers and a lot of clients in a great way. And the unexpected is fun. Consumers love discovering the next gym that they didn't expect to enjoy. That's all I'll say. Right. Point well taken. Well, we're going to move into um, some Q&A. And um, what I'm going to do uh, is ask Lee Meng to come and join us because she's been sort of magically moderating all of this stuff too. And if there are some questions here that uh, we can address, I'd also li like to ask Alisa and Baleen to come back and join us too. They can turn themselves on because they may very well be better equipped to answer questions than Lee Meng, uh, or I should say Laura and myself are. So Lee Meng, what do we got here? So the first question is from Stacy. Um, the question is on back to the rosé and wine number two. Was there um, oak in that wine, Evan? There was zero oak, and they were very crystal clear about saying that in multiple places I read. I can understand why somebody might say that um, more from a textual standpoint. Uh, I think Laura actually mentioned that in, in, in one of her comments, but also there is this sort of light um, impression that there is sort of a, 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 a very, I don't wanna say a, a spice note, but there's something there that suggests something beyond the fruit, but no, to the best that I could, I could figure out, all the research that I did shows that this wine didn't even kiss a toothpick, much less hang out in a foudre or anything else like that. Yeah, I, I got that. I was just going to say, I love it that Stacey put herself out there to ask the question. Sometimes you taste something and you don't dare to ask yourself, like, am I the only one? I also felt that. Um, question on this organic movement, um, Laura. 
besides Germany, are you seeing it elsewhere in Europe? Like, for instance, Alsace, since we're talking about neighbors. Yes, Alsace, uh, Loire, uh, Champagne. So a disclaimer here, in all of Europe, EU countries are being pushed to incorporate sustainability for all styles of production, farming, everything, not just grapes, not just wine, but that is the thrust and it is a push uh, for all industries in that realm by 2030 to come online and have uh, full inclusion. But there hasn't been a lot of money associated with divvying that up and so we know it's an expensive process. We do feel that it's going to be delayed a little, but it, since the pandemic, there's been less discussion on that. But full disclosure, it is across all industries that are linked to production and farming um, throughout the EU countries. It would be great, actually, if, if maybe Pauline or, or Lisa, if you want to jump in. How is it working, have you found, with uh, various uh, regulatory bodies locally in terms of both the demands that they're obviously pushing on you, but also the support that they're giving you to make things like that happen? Not everybody is uh, our friends over at Chateau Coutet uh, who are, you know, doing it for 12 billion years. Other people are gradually incorporating it. What have you found in terms of working with the regulatory bodies, both at the CIVB level, perhaps Pauline in your case, but also the various organizations? And then Lisa, up to you as well. Uh, yes, so um, in, sorry, I didn't know. So um, in Bordeaux, uh, there is a big uh, movement. So there is currently a change in generation uh, pushing uh, for this uh, change as well in uh, environmental practices. So I would say, um, so right now it's uh, between 10 and 15% of the surface which are already uh, organic, but the pace of uh, conversion is, uh, is uh, currently uh, big. Uh, in, our, in our case, we are uh, running now half of the 80 hectares uh, organically. Um, and I would say that uh, it's frankly uh, more than encouraged. Uh, HVE uh, will be uh, in France uh, the basics uh, for all. Uh, it's not only in viticulture, you have uh, HV um, in uh, uh, all the types of uh, agriculture in France. And the idea is what the government is uh, saying, uh, even at the national level, is uh, that uh, any, uh, if you want to get any subsidies uh, to get uh, new uh, material to, to grow uh, organically, uh, then at least you have to be uh, HV. So it will be a common uh, standard, let's say, uh, to ask to, uh, first to get uh, approval from the local uh, uh, subsidies or any help from the government. And on the other side, uh, all the main uh, buyers um, are uh, at least uh, asking for uh, the HV uh, grade. Uh. A quick, quick follow-up question, and then I would love to get Lisa's take on that as well too. Obviously to be certified, Right? There's one thing to have organic practices that you do or sustainable practices that you do. To get ISO or organic certification is very expensive, as we know. But it sounds as if they're not willing to help you uh, with subsidies until you start demonstrating that you're doing. How does, how does that work for a winery you know, such as yourself? I mean, are you having to invest lots of your own money before you get any of that recompensated back to you um, or is there an understanding that the government will help you? Because certification, as we know, ESO and all those things is not cheap. Any comment, Pauline? No? Uh, sorry, I thought it was for it. No, I, I fully agree. Um, it's, uh, I would say it's uh, first expensive, but uh, it's um, mainly uh, time consuming uh, in small structures, uh, small firms, uh, family run businesses. Um, actually, many people already have uh, sustainable practices, 
but uh, maybe they uh, don't write it uh, the right way in the right table or um, so it's a lot of uh, at least in France uh, administrative uh, paperwork uh, as we can <laughs> as we are good uh, very good at um, to get uh, certified so it's uh, costly and uh, it's a lot of uh, time that you have to devote to that but um, uh, I prefer to see it uh, the other way around, which is uh, you review all your process. Uh, you uh, so you you need to devote time to it, but uh, at the end uh, you also uh, get uh, um, better practices and you improve your your work. So it's um, it's still okay. Uh, Evan, let me jump in here yeah. with a follow-up question to give Great. to Lisa. Um, so Lisa, thank you, Pauline. So Lisa, here's a question from Jeff to redefine um, and build on what Pauline has said. Are there common or universal definitions in Europe or even in Germany specifically um, that help to define what is sustainable, what is organic, you know, what is biodynamic? Um, actually, I think this is one of our biggest problems because um, in our winery we worked uh, organically for most of our parcels for over 15 years. It's been a development to find out which is the clearest way to work with the environment. But as in France, we've got this extreme passion for working uh, with paperwork and uh, different styles of different certifications and it's really, really difficult. Um, you cannot say there are um, there are specifications for Europe, but for every country, there are specified little certifications, which is bio, biodynamic, Demeter, which is clearly for us very, very difficult. 90% of, uh, uh, of our hectares are bio, but the rest is not clearly under the certification. This is our biggest problem. We work near the environment. Our um, thought of making wines is we make wines in our vineyards and not due to vinification. Um, this leads to, of course, leads to work with the environment, but certification is think, the, the biggest problem that governments now have with all the switch in the wine rules and the government, and it's not really clear to define which way we want to go. We are in the way of certification, but it takes three years, it takes many, many tests, but let's, uh, let's be honest, um, we know how we work and we're proud of it. And it just needs a sign and an improvement. And this is really complicated. Yeah. Touché. Thank you. Touché. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to move to a completely different subject. Wine number three, um, which is also your wine, Lisa. Uh, Nicole has a question here. If you can discuss the strong mineral component, um, where does that minerality come from? Um, it's really easy. We're talking about our soils. <laughs> um, we talk about gypsum soil and we talk also about, uh, we have reed sandstone, we have shell limestone, which all comes to very fine and really uh, styles. It makes it crispy. It makes it clear. And this is the most powerful tool we have in our cellars that we have different passes on these, uh, on these soils that create exactly this style. And it improves the, the Pinot Blanc to be a bit more crispier. And it improves the uh, Riesling to be not that acidity uh, proofed, but also minerality proofed. Um, this tool, we cannot lose and we're really glad about it. Great, great. Awesome. Uh, one last question, Evan, and I think we'll, we'll go into the close. Um, for both um, Laura and Lisa, uh, we'll start with Laura. Americans talk dry, but they drink sweet in many cases, says Andrew. Um, great majority of Germans talk dry and indeed consume dry wines. Um, what is, why has this been a big movement um, in this past decade with, um, you know, in the home of such sweet Riesling, the, this movement that you're seeing out there? You know, I think it's because there is an acceptance now that ripeness and power of fruit can almost mimic sweetness. So we didn't really have this style even 15 years ago. In essence, climate shift has allowed us to find this kind of decadence in terms of ripeness of fruit. 
and that coddling effect of acidity. So I think that we see that now, that's what em what's emotion. It's just our ability to translate that to the client, the guest, so that they understand this terminology that the ripeness of fruit may actually feel like there's a little bit of sweetness, but in fact, it tastes dry. So it's just getting their nerves calmed so that they understand it's not gonna be sweet and they're gonna enjoy it and it's gonna have amazing balance and be very food friendly. That's the quest. Lisa, uh, did you wanna come back? Uh, I think and really just join in because um, I remember a few years ago when I was working in one of my Michelin star restaurants and there was a guy who told me to an eight course meal. Um, I love your wine pairing, but I don't drink Riesling. And for me as a sommelier and as um, a bit of an ego, I can say, okay, you can get eight pairs of Riesling for sure, which means he doesn't like this much acidity. But we have this really interesting pairing that there is a fruitiness, which Laura already said, which is all, always in our minds when we smell and taste fruit, our mind says, okay, it must be sweet. But that's bullshit, really. It's just because of this intense flavor and intense nose. Um, when we serve dry wines here, mostly in Germany, we have the biggest problem when someone comes in our winery and says, um, uh, I don't like dry wines. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay, I'm going to search some Auslese or something like that. Oh my God, I'm going to find something. No, it just means we need some fruitier wines. For example, Pinot Blanc, it can be so fruity and so, so immense in the, in the sense. And this is the wine that I can use. So the biggest problem about this development is just that we can stay dry, but we can develop with the smell and the tastiness, which always comes with our soil uh, and our home. That's the most important thing. Great. Thank you. Evan, I think we'll go to the last slide. Let's see if I can get it there. Oh, of course, it decided to freeze on the last slide. So, uh, ah, well, uh, how about if I just talk through it while I unshare my screen, if it's decided to lock on me here. Sometimes they do it. Thank God they do it at the end and not at the beginning or in the middle. But anyway, um, first and foremost, a big uh, fat thank you um, to, uh, to Laura, to Pauline, to Lisa, to uh, Matthew and Adrian on the uh, on video. A big, uh, incredibly important um, thank you as well to the folks at Clink Different for having the um, uh, generosity to share with our delegation, all of you out there, this incredibly important and eye-opening campaign that they're doing. Uh, as I really think it's an important place to be right now, and it does change our vantage points on two very traditional areas to hear from our, our folks today and to hear uh, from Laura and, and obviously as uh, Dr. Fauci likes to say, data speaks, right? Um, just remember to please uh, fill out your evaluation survey as soon as you can. Um, this The feedback is very, very important. Again, um, bit.ly uh, back, backslash clink underscore eval. It'll come with your recording as well too tomorrow if you don't remember to do it today. And um, now we're gonna go into the happy half hour. For those of you who wanna do it, I know many of you out there um, don't wanna be on screen respectfully. We agree with that, we understand. Some of you I, don't wanna